this is what I hope people understand when um, maybe it's working parents, especially single parents who want to homeschool. This is what's really important to understand. You get to make your schedule. I, I look back on my life and I just think, man, just that one decision changed everything. And my mom, of course, is, is so glad that she chose life for me. I was married to him for eight years um, and it was abusive the entire time. But, you know, I, I just kept thinking he could change. You know, things could get better. Two years before I left, he held a gun to my head and I was very sure I wasn't going to make it through that night. Well, good evening there, Nikki Truesdell. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. I think I'm looking forward to this. This is the first one I'm recording like on the road. Uh, well, well, sort of sort of the first one, but uh, like I'm now on the other side of the world. I was in Brazil before this. So uh it's, uh, it's interesting trying to set up times with people that are in the States because I think it must be like, I don't know, 8 p.m. for you and it's 7 a.m. for me. So <laughs> thank you for, for staying up late. No problem. Nikki, I've had uh, quite a few homeschooled kids on the podcast, actually. And I've also met many homeschooled uh, kids uh, while traveling around the world. Uh, literally, parents are in different countries, like the last last time was in Vietnam. I've met uh, homeschooled kids uh, traveling in, in Argentina. And they are literally like the sort of most smart, advanced uh, children I've ever met. I felt like I was having conversations with uh, with like you know young adults it was it was pretty remarkable that's so cool there is a difference um it's fun to hear about you meeting so many different ones around the world because i'm just so used to the american homeschool world so that's really awesome yeah i mean we were literally like you know going to breakfast <clears throat> and then you know they were they were finishing their breakfast and then getting out their their books and like putting them on the on the table and i mean it was the one place was in this awesome place in Vietnam, which was just like the most beautiful setting. And I'm like, wow, that's quite a cool place to to do your schoolwork for a couple of hours today. So really awesome. <laughs> that is. Do you know if they lived there permanently or they traveled also? Oh, no, they were traveling. They were like, yeah, we, we're traveling slowly. And um, that's what we that's what we're doing. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's possible, isn't it? It is. That's that's an amazing way to get an education, too. That's so cool. For sure. We're actually traveling at the moment with our young daughter. In my opinion, I, I feel like traveling is literally one of the best teachers. It, it teaches you so much about the world, yourself. It teaches you how to handle like, you know, stressful situations and quick changes and uh, just introduces you to new cultures and foods and just all these things which are important to know. Yes, that is awesome. I love it. I just want to start off a little bit with with your story. Like life began like in challenging circumstances. Uh, you know, your mom was 14 uh, when she had you and um, she had to drop out of uh, ninth grade. You actually wrote a, wrote a tweet about it. You said, today is my 52nd birthday. Was That's actually on the 15th of Jan, which is my mom's birthday as well. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> so today is my 52nd birthday. My mom was 14 when she had me. Her mom rec recommended illegal abortion. She could have easily said yes, but she didn't. I'm eternally grateful to have my life, my husband, my three daughters, my two sons, my two grandchildren. Choose life. So I just wanted to say like, you know, that's pretty incredible. And wow, aren't we grateful that you know, your mom chose to to make the right decision because that legacy is now now living on, isn't it? I tell you what, I'm thankful for every day. And if I don't live past 52, I will still be, I can still say right now that I'm thankful for every moment because, you know, my mom could have chose differently and and she didn't. And I, I do thank God for every single year I've had. And now, and I tell my kids this quite often, because my mom chose life for me, they have life. And now I have two grandchildren also. And so it's just amazing when you think, um, especially thinking about how hard it might be to be a young pregnant teenager. And, you know, you kind of focus on the here and now, like, this is going to be really hard. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can raise a baby or it's not fair to me. It's not fair to the baby. But I, I look back on my life and I just think, man, just that one decision changed everything. And my mom, of course, is, is so glad that she chose life for me. My grandmother, who had offered my mom that, that choice, was, as she told me so many times, she was glad that I was born. And um, of course, my kids are happy to be here. My husband is thankful. And so it is amazing. And I, 
do really want people to understand you can't just focus on problems that you see right in front of you because they're usually temporary. I mean, almost all it's temporary and it's worth the struggle you might be going through to get out of it to get to the other side. And you just have no idea what it holds. So the struggle is don't don't focus on that. Focus on the future. For sure. I mean it's but it, like you said, as a as a 14 year old, I mean I'm just thinking back to me as a 14 year old, the only thing I was really interested in was, was playing sports and, uh, and that's about it, you know, um, just, I, 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 your mom must've been pretty incredible, resilient, strong young woman to, to do that at that age. Cause I mean, I know personally, I'd have no, I, I would, I just wouldn't know what to do, you know? Oh yeah. It is very young. And when my daughters have reached that age at different times, I've said, you're the age that granny was, you know, when she became a mom and. I'm thankful that doing that, but it is, it's kind of eye opening to everyone in the family to just go, wow. And my youngest daughter is 13 now. And so she's very close to that. And I'm just thankful that they, they're here, but I'm also thankful that they understand um, the gift of being a child, being a young teenager and, and not becoming a parent so young, but I'm, I'm thankful that my mom was tough enough to go through with it every single day. Absolutely. And, and yourself, I mean, You've now got five kids. That truly is impressive. And uh, I mean, yeah, what a, just like what an amazing journey that must be. Hey, like having, having five children um, and, and you've homeschooled them all, which is, which is remarkable. Yeah. They are truly homegrown. (laughs) They were all born at home too. I didn't go to the hospital. So, um, you know, home birth is pretty popular here. And so kind of did uh, a lot of, my, my mom did a lot of that, you know, she, as you know, she homeschooled my sister and me, but uh, I was given that example and took it a little further. My sister and I both had all of our children at home too. Um, and so I can definitely say they're all very homegrown kids. That's so amazing. I mean, yeah, like we, we're so uh, sort of led to believe that you, you have to go to a hospital to have your kids and all these sort of things. And then, I mean... I had this amazing lady on my podcast, uh, Janice Barcelo, who who focuses on things like birth trauma and uh, the whole sort of birth process and stuff. And and it is actually one of the most like eye opening podcasts I've ever had in my entire life. She kind of exposed me to things that I I, I never knew about that were, were rather frightening about like hospitals and what they do to the kids and like you know the the, the mothers as well and and all these things. And it's just like people don't even realize that they've been born with trauma, you know, like that's how they enter the world. It's such a difference to have your children at home. Um, and I didn't even go into it with, with the idea that I was avoiding trauma. Even I just knew that it was, um, a much more holistic experience. There was going to be fewer interventions to be more peaceful. I didn't want any, um, surgeries or drugs if they weren't necessary. And of course, you know, my midwives were always very careful to make sure I was healthy enough for a home birth and um, that it wasn't going to cause that I have further problems. But each each birth was um, very straightforward and healthy. I had excellent care and um, I, it was amazing. I have witnessed some hospital births and I'm very thankful for the five home births that I was able to have. Wow, that's amazing. It's actually very interesting and now just knowing your story a little bit, because one of the things this lady talks about is like often trauma is like sort of passed on, especially like birth trauma. So like, uh, you know, if your mom, you know, your mom obviously decided in the end to have you. And, uh, so, so that was like a, a beautiful, a beautiful thing. And then now you like really just express that yourself through these home births and no issues and stuff. So that obviously was, you know, a nice break in whatever cycle, which is really cool. I think so. I, yeah, there's a lot of talk about that breaking the cycle and I, you know, we'll probably get into this a little bit more, but, um, my mom and dad did break a lot of cycles because they, they had come out of a life of drug abuse and alcohol abuse and, you know, both had run away from home and gotten into different kinds of trouble. Um, but when I was about eight years old, they became Christians and we, We started, I mean, turned the whole life around, started going to church. Um, We didn't have a TV. Obviously, we started homeschooling at that time. So we did just a complete 180, and it really impacted my whole life, as you can probably guess. You know, just 
um, stepping away from everything that was normal, you know, to everyone else and doing things differently. And um, they were very bold in their convictions and bold to live them out, even when other people didn't understand. And that has given me, I think, the ability to do what I do now, which is to speak boldly about more. I mean, they didn't have the internet. They were just living their lives and just being bold in front of, you know, friends and family. And 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 that was hard, you know, in the 80s. But I believe that they they gave me the push without even trying, but they set the example for me to go a little further in that boldness and to tell the world, you can do this. Yeah, this is no big deal. It's um, just, you don't have to follow what everyone else in the world is doing, you can step out and do something different and it'll be really amazing. And it's not hard like everyone makes it sound. So they, they really set some, some great examples for me to get where I am today. I always say to, to people that the, the sort of best form of leadership is leading by action or leading through action. You know, like you you can tell people to do as much as you think you, you know it, they'll have an influence on them, but it it won't. They, they will they will look at you and they'll see what you're doing, and if they sort of align with it, they'll be like, "Cool, I'll I'll do that too." You know, that's right. Yeah, lead by example, and especially your kids. I mean, kids are they, they look up to you like superheroes. So if if you're gonna do something, they're probably gonna copy you. And it's just such a good thing for parents to be aware of. It's a big responsibility, um, but it's it's a really neat one too. I mean, even the smallest things. Like yesterday, I was on this like water slide with my daughter, and she's only like two and a and a quarter right, years old. And I was just like, I was I was like splashing water up the up the slide, and then she starts splashing water up the slide. And I'm like, that's literally what they do. They just copy you. It doesn't matter what it is. And it's and so cute. you know the big things too. Like they. Uh, they're going to copy you. So it's it's just like, like you said, it's such a, a, a great responsibility to have, but you you really have to be conscious like of your actions and your words and stuff as, as a parent. Absolutely, yeah. You've sort of touched on this now, right? Um, you, you, you wrote, uh, this is another tweet you wrote, in 1983, my mom and dad took us out of public school for a new life. Uh, she had a ninth grade education. He had a high school degree, um, oh, sorry, a high school diploma. I was 11, my sister was eight, they operated with conviction, faith, and and curriculum with answer keys. Don't overcomplicate homeschooling. So, you you mentioned that they did that one eighty, right? Going from almost like uh, you know drugs and a different sort of lifestyle to uh, finding faith and um, and then I guess just turning everything around. Like like w- was there anything that initiated that? Do you know? Yes, actually. Um, so my aunt, my mom's sister, had had she'd been through she has quite a story herself she'd been through a lot and had her life changed she she'd become a christian and she and her husband started uh driving the church bus and they picked me and my sister up and took us to church and so i started asking my mom and dad why don't you come to church with us you know it was this little tiny country church in a small town in texas and um my mom refused for a long time. My dad had grown up in church. And so he wasn't, you know, he wasn't opposed, but he just wasn't ready. So it took a little while, but finally he, and he's my stepdad. He started going to church and my mom would sit in the car in the parking lot, wouldn't go in, but eventually she did. And, um, they both became solid Christians. You know, that was, I think I said in 1982 is when that happened. Or, or 81. Anyway, that was it. I mean, it was a radical salvation Christianity and um, changed their lives forever, you know, big, big change. And so it changed our lives. I can remember the difference even as an eight-year-old. I can just look back and and see the difference from before and after. And it's amazing. It's almost like a, a feeling, I guess, inside of you. You felt a difference as well, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. And, and life even for me as a kid was better, you know, there was not uncertainty or fear, um, you know, having parents who were strung out on drugs and alcohol, you know, they were sober, they were clean, they were living as, as righteously as they could. And they were just, they were both dedicated to changing their lives completely. And so even as a kid, I, I knew the difference and it was, 
It was life changing, literally. That, that literally is life changing. I mean, I've actually had quite a few uh, people on the podcast again that have uh, had parents that are, uh, you know, either drug abusers, uh, alcoholics, mm-hmm. um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that scars people for life, you know, like, and, and I guess in your instance, it's, it's so fortunate that your, your parents found God and turned their lives around because that means your life is so different. Otherwise you would have just been probably some young girl with no direction, possibly a, you know what I mean? Like you just never know. Hey, I remember, and, and we can, my mom and I, you know, my sister can remember some pretty outlandish stories that happened before they became Christians. Um, and we can laugh. We can say, wow, that was crazy. Do you remember that? You remember this one time when you did this, you know, instead of looking back and feeling like you're still living that it's for us, it's in the past. It was a terrible thing, but it was over and we, we live to tell about it. And so, yeah, it's definitely, it's something that affected my life. And like I said, future generations after me too. And that transition from uh, like sort of normal public school into homeschooling, do you recall it at all? Any sort of like memories of that? Yes, I do. So I was in public school through the fifth grade and um, my parents met uh, a family locally. I, I don't remember how they met them, but these these people were already homeschooling their kids locally. And my mom, having had the past that she did, immediately latched onto this idea. You know, she was thinking, if I can get my kids out of public school before something similar happens to them, then let's do it. Let's let's do that. And so um, she didn't need the education. You know, she was assured that you can do this if you have the determination, the conviction, and you have some good materials to use, then you can do this. And so um, this family walked my parents through all the steps, kind of showed us how a typical day in a homeschool looked and helped them figure out the materials and how to set up a schedule and everything. So it was really neat for them to have these mentors. And um, so we moved to a different small town, which kind of helped make that break and started having school at home. And and for us, it was very much like a traditional school day. Um, I don't, I don't homeschool that way with my kids now, but we, you know, we had a schedule start at eight o'clock. We had a schedule with all of our different um, courses that we needed to take. We had a lunch break and a recess and, you know, all of that. We raised our hand if we needed help, just like you would at school. So it was, it felt still very traditional, but we were at home. And so our recess was out in the backyard and we had goats and um, dogs and cats and you know, we would go in our own kitchen for a snack and then go outside and then sit back down at our desks and work on our lessons some more. So, and then part of the time we lived in town and part of it, we lived in the country, but in town, you know, we had neighborhood friends. And so when they got home from school, we went and played with them. So it was, um, I still consider it to be a very normal lifestyle, even back in the eighties. And, you know, besides my sister and me, my two cousins were the only other kids in town homeschooling at the time. And uh, it probably was weird to everyone else. But for us, it was, I mean, still pretty normal childhood. You know, we just didn't go to the same school as everyone else in town. Eventually, though, other people, other people in our church thought, "Mm -hmm, I think we'll try that too. And so as the 80s moved on, more and more people began homeschooling around us. So that was kind of cool. That's very cool to see. There's the lead to reaction, you know. People are like, wow, that's cool. I want to do that as it well. It is and possible. Yeah. Yeah, and totally. Uh, so it was also interesting you wrote about uh, your parents getting arrested because homeschooling wasn't even like legal back then in, in Texas. Um, crazy. So what's funny about that is at the time we were living in Oklahoma, we kind of crossed the, the border, uh, you know, a few times in my life. And so we were in the state of Oklahoma at the time. And it actually was legal, but no one was doing it. And so no one really was thinking about this, but it was written into the state constitution, which I think was um, 1908 or something like that. So it was already part of the state constitution. Um, But we were in a very small town, um, just, you know, the population was in the hundreds, you know, very small. And so when, when 
Two families in town did not send their kids to school that September. Everyone noticed it. The um, the sheriff, I guess he was the sheriff, the police officer. We had one police officer in town. He was friends with my parents. He went to our church, but he was the one sent to make the arrest by the county. And so it was a September morning in 1983. Uh, first thing in the morning, they came and woke my parents up and said, your children are truant, and we're going to take you to the sheriff's office. And so um, my they took my mom and my stepdad, and they also went and arrested my aunt, who was living across town. And she was a single mom, homeschooling my two cousins, and they arrested her too. And so the pastor of our church picked us all up and took all of us kids to their house and um, took all of the adults. So the Sheriff took all the adults to the sheriff's office a couple of towns away, and they kept them all day. They did not actually lock them up, but they kept them, and immediately, I don't even know where all this help came from, but uh, lawyers from different parts of the United States who were starting to consider forming a legal organization for homeschoolers. Um, got wind of what was happening and they got on the case. They got on the phone. Um, They assured the sheriff that my parents were not breaking any laws and that, you know, as I said, the constitution actually guaranteed this right. And so that night before, you know, before the night ended, they were released and they, there was a trial set for, I think the following January and it never went to trial. It was the whole case was dismissed after lots of phone calls from all over the state. And that was the end of that. Um, So that was in 1983 when the arrest happened. Um, In two more years, we moved back to Texas, which is where we're all from. Um, And so we moved back to Texas and it still was not legal in Texas, but we were homeschooling anyway. So we moved back here in 85 and it was finally legalized in 1994. we were not arrested again, oddly enough, <laughs> where it was illegal, but there were uh, the movement was growing and growing. And so there were people fighting it in different areas. There were arrests being made, just not, you know, not my parents again. And so because of all those other people getting arrested and hiring lawyers, it was finally legalized in Texas in 1994. So, um, we did go in March at a of events to you know, and the big mass of homeschool families who were saying we want this freedom, and so we um, didn't play a huge part as as lawsuits go, but we were part of that. That you know, being for that right, and so I'm thankful we have it now in Texas too. In fact, all 50 states in the United States have it, so no more fear. Yeah, for sure. It's it's kind of crazy when you think about it, like. You know, now we, I mean, that was 1994 and we're still like a pretty advanced civilization at, at that stage. And it was like illegal to homeschool your kids. You kind of have to really almost bang your head against a, a wall sometimes to, <laughs> to wonder what's going on. It's eh? just because the public school system became the norm for so many decades And everyone was fine with it until they weren't, you know, until it became clear that maybe they're teaching things we don't want the kids to learn, or maybe the social environment is not healthy. You know, there was, even in the 80s, there were quite a few reasons to be schooling. And so it was, um, it was just that, that little group of people rebelling and saying, you know what, this is not normal and we're not going to do it. Um, But it was really hard for people to accept, especially the, uh, the authorities, <laughs> but it, I mean, as you probably see on Twitter, it's still hard for some people to accept that a parent can do it without the school system, but wow, it was, it was a lot of people to understand back then. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things there, uh, like, which is important for people to know is like, it doesn't take a, a large percentage of say a population to resist for change to happen. You know, it's, it, we don't need like 90% of us to kind of resist. Sometimes it's just almost like 
I think there's, there's, a, there's a statistic. It's something like 3%. It's not even like massive at all uh, to create that change, you know? Um, so that's really cool that, you know, that we have those few people that, um, you know, can, can provide change. And, and it's important, especially in this day and age, in this environment with what we're experiencing in the world, like where it feels like basically, I don't know, everyone's, everyone's against normalcy. Um, so us that are still sort of like a little bit coherent and can, and, and have a bit of clarity in our minds, you know, we must keep up the resistance. We must keep talking up and, uh, and, and provide that sort of backbone that is needed in society at the moment to, you know, to make sure that it's kind of stays a bit stable and, uh, we have a bright future. Oh, I definitely agree. One of our American founders said that it just takes a small, tireless minority to make change. It doesn't, you don't need a majority, just a tireless minority. So yeah, absolutely. That's a very important word because it feels like at the moment they are, it's like they are just sort of knocking, 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 knocking. And, and it's up to us to just go, okay, cool. Don't let them knock you down. Just carry on standing up because eventually, you know, the light will prevail. So, <laughs> um, yeah, really interesting. <clears throat> um, so look, your story is fascinating um, and I'm getting to the homeschooling stuff uh, very, very soon, but I think this is also like, this is a nice almost segue, which I think, uh, you know, allows us to sort of get into that, that part. Um, you wrote that at 22, or sorry, 22 years ago, uh, I ran away from an abusive husband, uh, owning just a car and $300. I had two kids, no home and no income. The girls had never been to school or daycare before. Homeschooling was hard and totally worth it. I found that where there's a will, there's a way. There are many ways. Firstly, just like that is such a brave thing to do. I, I know that most people that are in abusive relationships, they're probably too scared to, to run away because they, they're worried about the consequences, I guess the reaction, the rage, whatever it is. Um, so like, what was the straw that broke the camel's back for you? Well, I was married to him for eight years. Um, and it was abusive the entire time, but you know, I, I just kept thinking he could change, you know, things could get better if I was, and, and, um, you know, I, I understand now how an abused spouse thinks because I'm away from it. And I can look back and see that my mindset was just trapped. I was hopeful, but I was trapped. And um, I, I couldn't even see how bad it was because I was on the inside. Um, and for years afterwards, it I still felt some of the fears that I had then. And so there is a very specific mindset that an abuse has, and they don't realize it, they don't see it when they're there. I didn't even recognize it. I recognized that it wasn't right, but there was there's still a part of me that still defended my need to stay. Um, anyway, so he was abusive verbally. Um, he was controlling and as far as you know what I could do, where I could go, um, money that I was allowed to have if I made him angry. Um, you know, he would take away my car keys or he let the air out of my tires. You know, there's, there's just a lot of controlling. Um, there was a, an incident where, um, two years before, two years before I left, um, he held a gun to my head and I was very sure I wasn't going to make it through that night. Um, and I was pregnant with my second daughter at the time and I still stayed for two more years. That's, that's, just if you can imagine what kind of mindset would would cause a person to, to do that. Um, but the day that he became physically abusive, the light bulb came on and I said, I have to go. I've got to go. And so um, I called my mom the morning that morning. He had just left for work and I said, I'm ready to leave. And so I called a couple of friends. My parents were out of town and they couldn't help me, but I had other friends nearby and they came with trucks and trailers, packed up everything we had, helped us move out, put all our stuff in storage. And I was out of there before he got home from work that day. Um, it just, 
you would think that being threatened with a gun would be enough and it wasn't. It was, you know, being shoved up against the wall and threatened physically that really did it for me. And so I didn't look back. Um, and like I said, I had nothing but my car and our belongings and my parents were building a house, but it wasn't finished and we went and lived there anyway. So we were living in a partially constructed home, my daughters and I, and, um, it was worth it. And I have not regretted it since it was, it was the right thing to do. And my daughters are grown now and they absolutely agree with me that it was the right thing to do. And I worried for a while how they would see that, you know, it, would they grow up and and be bitter towards me, but they have not, (laughs) they, they totally agree with me. No, I mean, yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent the right decision. I mean, my, my theory on a lot of like definitely abuse. Um, but if a man, I mean, it happens both ways. Like sometimes women are abusive too, but like if a man raises a hand to a woman, I'm sorry, you, you've got to, well, you've definitely got to leave as, as a lady. I know it's not always possible because fear is like crippling. Um, but if I had to ever, <clears throat> excuse me, catch a man raising his hand to a woman, <laughs> it would be the last time he ever did that. I can promise you right now. Like the, the, it's, it's the most disgusting, um, it, like emasculine thing to ever do, like weak, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm really sorry you had to go through that. Like it's, it's tragic. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Did, did your daughters have any sort of, uh, relationship with that guy now or not at all? Oh no, they don't. Um, they both chose at different times to end the relationship with him in their teenage years. Um, so I didn't have anything to do with it. They, they just, you know, legally I was supposed to let them go visit with him on different weekends. But once they got into their teen years, they, they decided on their own, they couldn't do it anymore. And of course I didn't make them. And now as adults, it's totally their choice. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's easy for me to look back now and say that was the right thing to do, but it was hard knowing that he would be angry with me. I mean, he was furious, but also there's that fear of starting over, which is very hard to, and we did start all over. You know, I I ruined my credit and uh, I had a college degree, but I going to raise my daughters. And um, so I was trying to figure out how to, you know, how to keep us fed and, and housed and clothed and raise them. And that's probably what you want to get into next. But um, that, that fear of starting up and possibly not having money or not having anything, I think is a lot of people from making that escape when they really should. And so, like I said earlier, some problems seem so big and like they're the worst ever. But I can look back now and go, that was nothing. (laughs) That was nothing at all. It was worth it. It was worth the struggle. It was very hard, and I'm so glad I did it. One thing I always think that people maybe underestimate is the the power of people coming together and um, helping helping each other. I think deep down, there's there's this this uh, innate uh, way that humans are. You know, like we actually do really want to help other people you know, especially like in times of, of need or crisis. And uh, you, you, you definitely know who your mates are then, that's for sure. The, the, they, the, they, you filter them in and out very quickly. Uh, but they, the ones that are there to help you and want, want you to sort of succeed or get out of whatever hole you're in, they're going to sort of back you. Yeah, I had a, a really great church family and that's where I went for help. And they came through and supported me, you know, during the abusive marriage on the day that I left and afterwards. And so makes a difference to have a support, a support system. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing what you, you've gone through and then what was the next step then? Like, so that family helped you. I mean, you're still, you had really nothing. Um, you didn't even have a, a, a full roof over your head because <laughs> your parents were still building their house. Like what were the next steps after that? Like I said, my, my thought then was just survival. For a while. And so we, we stayed at their house and I started trying to figure out how I would make money, you know, and I did not want to 
send the girls to daycare. They'd never been to daycare. They, my oldest was six. And so we had already done one year of homeschooling. And then the youngest one was two. And the last thing I wanted to do after what we'd just been through was to send them to school and daycare and go off to work because I hadn't done that since they were born. And so my first thought was, how will I keep raising them the way I've been raising them and also survive <laughs> financially? Um, and so I had to start by having money to pay for food and um, gas for the car and, you know, things that the girls needed. My parents obviously let me live at their house for free. And um, so I started getting part-time jobs because I wanted to be with the girls. And so between um, their weekends with their dad, which I eventually had to allow, and my parents eventually, sometimes coming up for the weekends, whenever they were in their dad's care or in my parents' care, then I would work. And so I did things like um, cleaning a church. I did some child care did um I taught some craft classes at a local store, just whatever I could do basically on a very flexible schedule, I did. And I made a little money here and a little there. Um for about six months I was able to get government help with with groceries. But as soon as I started to have a real paycheck, that went away. Um so I finally got a, a part-time job at a local hospital doing medical transcription. And so I hired a babysitter who was this sweet grandmother lady who lived nearby, and she would come to our house and watch the girls. And it was really, really a blessing. I mean, it was an answered prayer because she treated them like her own grandchildren, and um, I knew they were safe. I knew they were at at our house, you know, my mom and dad's house. And even um, some of the homeschooling lessons she would do with my older daughter and it was it was just so nice to know that I could be at work. I only worked about four hours a day, but I could go to work and know that they were safe and they were happy. They really liked her and I was making money. And so that was basically what we did for a while was just survive. <laughs> I mean, that lady sounds like a like a godsend, literally. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the lesson is in there, which I think, you, you know, you've written tons of, about this, you know, is that. Uh, there's always a uh, sort of poss the possibility of homeschooling. It doesn't matter kind of what your, your situation is. And um, one of the things that you, you write about is like all year, all year round homeschooling, um, which I think is, is also really cool. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about that, please? Basically, we don't worry about the school year that everyone else is on. Um, I say this a lot on, online, and, and that's that we are a family. We are not a school. And so we do things the way we want to. Yes, my children are educated. They have math and English and history and all of those lessons, but that's about where the similarities end. You know, we don't wait until September to start and we don't stop in May. So off and on through even those, early, I did this out of necessity. We do it out of choice. But if you're a homeschool, you, basically get to your schedule, your life, just like talked about with the people who travel in homeschool. They don't have a schoolroom set up, obviously, at home. They scare ever and whenever they need to. And so, um, you know, where we live in, we have pretty hot summers, so we enjoy the air conditioning. <laughs> and so in summer, we are indoors uh, often doing schoolwork. But when the fall comes and the temperatures are nice again, we get out and enjoy that and we have fewer school days. Um, the, and it's just, it's teaching yourself to think outside the school year and outside the box, just outside the whole school box, letting go of everything you know about how schools normally run and realizing, okay, we're, we're a family and we're going to also do our lessons you know, we're also going to study all the math and all of the language arts and all of that, but the rest of it's up to us. And it doesn't matter what day it is or what month it is or what time of day it is. You know, we're, we're just going to make sure it happens and always move forward. And so back then when I was working part-time and, you know, life wasn't 
a breeze because we were all three dealing with the trauma of divorce and single motherhood and being, you know, horribly broke and, you know, so many things. Um, every day wasn't just a rosy school day. It, sometimes we slept in, sometimes we cried, you know, sometimes they just wanted to sit and talk about, um, or they just were not going to be able to have a school lesson, you know, whatever it was, I needed to be flexible. And so I was kind of forced into learning this the hard way that I could be flexible because we were living life. And at that time, some of that life meant struggle, you know, a lot of struggle. And then when it was good, maybe we wanted to go to the park instead of sitting down with a school book, you know, on certain days. Or if my parents came into town, I wanted to do something fun with them. And so we did. And then other days we, we would pull out the school lessons. And so it was something that was kind of shoved in my face. And I realized after a time, yeah, this works too. You know, it doesn't have to be just like everybody else does it. I actually think that's probably one of the, the best lessons you can have. Like it's, it, it shows you the sort of fragility of life and just like the, the curveballs that you've thrown in life as well. And that, you know, there's, there's certain ways to deal with those. And uh, that's almost like a lesson within itself for the kids just through kind of osmosis. Probably. It is because, man, those were not the only curveballs that we had over the years. I mean, that was in um, 2002 when, when we started living that way. But over the years, there have been other things like um, a move or a death in the family or, you know, I've had other jobs. Whatever it was, we learned to be flexible around whatever life was throwing at us, whether it was great or awful. And the kids learned to be flexible, but they also experienced those parts of life too. Instead of going off to school and we experienced them while they were going to school, you know, it was a whole family thing. And for for good and for bad, it was the family experiencing things together. And so sometimes that's harder, but that's real life. Like that's education and and teaching our children how to to, to get through even the really hard times is really important. And I think the things that makes people think, oh, I can't do that is, you know, this very common question, what if we get behind, you know, we have to stop because of a move or a death in the family or a new baby's born or whatever, we're going to get behind and my kids are going to fail. But I don't think in terms of behind, you know, and that's something that I, I still try to tell people a lot, like, um, first of all, I say behind who, you know, you in that system anymore. So don't try to stay on, on the same course as that system. But, um, the, the public school system is highly inefficient and it offends people when I say that, but once you're out of it for a while, you, you recognize it and there's so much busy work. There's so much time filler that happens. It's not necessary And so when you are homeschooling, you get to just focus on the important stuff, you know, and not try to fill the time from eight to three, you know, we got to stay busy all day long. You just get to the important stuff. And when you finished your lesson, you're done with the lesson instead of, well, this is a 50 minute class. So we've got to spend 50 minutes on every lesson. You know, there's so much time wasted. And so when you realize that, then you start to see that the time that it takes to educate at home is so much less. And if you don't need as much time as the public school is is using, you don't need their calendar. And so if you don't need their calendar and you take a month off of school in the middle of a school year, really not behind because when you are having school, your your time is focused on what's important and not on you know, counting off hours and minutes and months and all of that. Does that make sense? It makes 100% sense. And, and I actually, I actually think that, that like when you probably become like a a homeschooling parent, your, your almost your way of sort of guiding your kid through life changes. So that month that you say you're not at school, you're still like in this kind of flow of like, okay, cool. How can I, um, you know, maybe teach my kids something just through whatever we're going to do today, you know? So that's actually the lesson you're on holiday or whatever the story is taking a break, but you still, 
you're in this mindset, like, how can I, how can I do something to teach this kid, you know, a, a lesson or life lesson or whatever it is. And, and it's not coming from a book and it's not on a quiz or on a worksheet, but you start to realize I'm teaching my children so many things that can't be measured on a test and that I can't mark off on a checklist, but they're soaking it in, you know, today or this week, actually my car battery died. And so my, my 16 year old son was learning how to try to give it a jump. Then he went with my husband to the sh- the store to buy a new battery and learned all about the warranty and how to take the old one out, put the new one in. Well, you know, at school they call that shop or auto shop or whatever. And then they throw in a bunch of other stuff that, that takes up time, but you know, he just taught him how to do it. And so now both of my sons have had the experience of changing a battery and learning how to jump one off to see if it'll start first and, you know, all of those little things. And, and when you think about how many of those normal life happen when kids are at school that they're missing, it's amazing how much you could be teaching them, you know, through the normal course of life. Or like my daughter this morning, my 13 year old made pancakes. And she said, this recipe calls for two tablespoons of baking powder. That's why they're so fluffy. Good for you. You figured it out, you know, and it didn't have to, it wasn't in a science workbook or, uh, you know, the a home economics class. She just figured it out because she had made several different pancake recipes and these were the fluffiest. And so just normal life teaches so much. And we are so used to a school system that says, here's your list of things you have to do. Here's all the books, all the years you have to spend seven or eight hours a day, five days a week for your whole childhood. Then you're educated. But really, that's that's not how people learn. I mean, we do learn a lot from a book. You know, I'm not saying books are not important because I absolutely love them. But we've been told, here's how you educate kids. And then we've just made it so much worse than it has to be when people learn through living and doing and talking and watching and all sorts of ways. And so kids are missing out on that because they're at school all the time. The best way, in my opinion, to learn is through doing. And, you know, you're, you're, like you said, your son's there, they changed the battery. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Like at 16, that's like how, how cool is that, you know? And, and then, you know, your daughter learning how to bake and, and then realizing, okay, cool. Well, I've done it once this way and they weren't that fluffy. Let me try another way. Okay, it still wasn't fluffy. Now let me try it again. Ah, that's what it is. I need the two eggs and, you know, this amount of sort of baking powder. And it's like, it's awesome. Like that's literally the way you learn is through trial and error, isn't it? It is. And they will remember that because they didn't just read it on a worksheet. They did it, you know. And so that's so much more valuable. Way more valuable. One of the really interesting things that you that you just sort of touched on there and you write a lot about is actually, uh, I guess, sleep and the importance of it, but also that then ties into the sort of structure of say school days. Uh, years ago, I read this book uh, called Why We Sleep by this guy, Matthew Walker. He's like a sleep sort of expert, <clears throat> excuse me. And he he said that like so much of society is structured completely wrong. Um, and, and one of the specific things he said about is like uh, school, so at, at different ages, kids are sort of maturing um, in, in different ways, you know, and when they're teenagers, they, their hormones are going wild and uh, their growth spurts are, are like really, really big and they actually need uh, more sleep. And that's why, you know, kids sleep in until like 10, 11 sometimes, you know, like not every kid, but a lot of them do. Um, and that's, it's not because they're lazy. It's actually just their their DNA, their physiology, right? It's that's what happens at that stage of your life because you're gro- going through these crazy growth spurts. And, um, but, but what we're doing now in schools is like, no, well, you must wake up at six cause you've got to start at seven or seven thirty, And, and their first like four hours of school is like a complete blur because they're fast asleep. And, and it's just like, what's the point? We're doing it completely wrong. Like let those high school kids maybe start school at 12 o'clock because they're going to just, they're going to be much more sort of, um, sort of awake um, and uh, sort of taking the, uh, you know, what they're being taught and these sort of things. But the system is definitely not designed that way. No. Oh, boy, I get pushback on that one too. And I talk about letting my kids sleep later because <laughs> it's such a strange, 
it's such a strange society when people say your kids need to be prepared for the real world. And I just think, well, they're not working a corporate job. So let's wait until they are. And then they, you know, then they will. And and I've seen that with my adult children, even the ones that had trouble waking up as teenagers, you know, at a certain time when they got a job, they woke up and they went to the job. And what's so funny is um, all three of my kids who have graduated got jobs with that required them to get up very early, like four in the morning to get there. You know, two girls were baristas for a while. And and my other son, I can't remember what he did, but <clears throat> he always had to be, oh, he worked at a convenience store for a short time and he had to be there really early. And so it's incredible, but they learned how to wake up early because they needed to be at their job so that they could make money. And so even now with my younger teenagers, <clears throat> I let them sleep till nine o'clock. And um, they get about an hour, hour and a half to wake up, eat breakfast, and do their morning chores before they start school. And often, they will take a nap later <laughs> in the afternoon. And so it's it's clear they need the sleep, but they're still capable when the time comes to set an alarm and get up and go somewhere on time. And so um, your children and even your teenagers don't need training for the corporate world. They they need sleep and they need um, they need that peace and some rest. And and of course, I I'm a Type A person. I'm I'm a structure schedule. I'm a morning person. But I understand that teenagers are growing and and like you said, they physically need more rest. Just like babies need a lot of rest because they're growing so much. It keeps happening throughout childhood. And so um, <laughs> I just laugh when people say, oh, your kids are not going to be prepared for the real world. And I always think, well, uh, experience has shown me different that when they get a job, they want to be there. So I don't have to do anything at that point. I think half the problem is is people don't actually really know um, a lot about humans and, and stuff like that. And we just program to believe certain things. I mean, the, one of the biggest things for me, right, after reading this book, and I kind of like, I don't regret like reading it late, but I, I wish I had read it early, you know, like, because I used to work um, in an investment bank when I was living in London. And um, I used to have some people on my team that would rock up, you know, because he had to start work super early, you know, and they would rock up and they would be like moody and like grumpy and y- they were half asleep, you could see. And I was like, and, and, and I would get angry because I'm also, the, I'm like this, not angry, but I'd be like, I'd, I'd kind of felt a bit let down. I'm like, come on, you're in work, be happy. Like, let's, let's go. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but, but what I didn't realize, and again was from this book, is that some people are actually morning people and some people are evening people. And it's, it's not even through your choice. And it's, once again, it's not because you're lazy. It's literally how you have been designed, right? So I would be, if I knew that, I would literally have gone, hey, you know what, I realize that you're not actually a morning person. Is this true? And they would go, absolutely. I'll be like, awesome, no worries. You know what, can you please come in at um, 11 o'clock rather than, than, than 7 o'clock? And they'd be like, absolutely no problem. And, and I'll, then they'll be like, okay, cool. Can you finish maybe then at, say, 8 o'clock in the evening? They'll go, absolutely no problem. I love the evenings. That's when I work the best. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, And that's what we don't, that, that's once again, like we, we're so, we've been so kind of like almost, programmed to believe that things work a certain way because society has this crazy structure to it but it, it's not it, it needs more flexibility to cater for everybody it does and and so when you talk about homeschooling you can do whatever you want <laughs> that's what i i i have such a hard time convincing people like you get to be the boss this is up to you now and so i have talked to different families over the years you know and said how what what do you do what does it look like and so you know, most people still have a morning routine with breakfast chores and school in the morning. Um, but I have talked to families who stayed up late because that was, you know, in fact, we did this for a while. My husband worked later hours, got to stay up later so they could see him when he came home. And so then later in the morning because he was going to get up and go to work. Um or some families, like the whole family, are night owls. And so they sleep till noon and then get up and do their homeschooling. Or they might not even start their lessons until... Um, I, I read about this one family that would get up and 
all pile into mom and dad together and watch TV in the morning. And, you know, some people will probably think, wait, you can't do that. You can't start the morning with TV. But they did. They would watch the Waltons. And it was just a fun family thing. And then eat breakfast and then start their day. And so, I mean, how fun would that be to grow up going, this is what my family did. And and it was fun and cozy. And um, they had great memories from that. And we had to be up at six to have school at the table at seven. You know, the thing is, every family should be able to choose what works for them. And this is what I hope people understand when um, maybe it's working parents and especially single parents who want to homeschool, this is what's really important to understand. You get to make your schedule. And so that's what I had to learn when I, um, whatever my work schedule was, that's where I started. And then everything else kind of fell around that. And so whenever we could do lessons, we did them. And if we couldn't, we didn't worry about it. And I still had my job and I still homeschooled my kids and we still spent time together, but it, the schedule was up to me. and. So there was, I won't say there was no stress, but there was a lot less stress as I was in charge instead of society's ideas being in charge of what we were doing. It's such an important thing for people to be aware of. And I remember speaking to uh, one of the girls uh, that I mentioned at the start that was was homeschooled on the podcast. Yeah. And um, she would, uh, in terms of the, the structure of their day, um, I think they, they would like start around about like nine-ish or something like that. And um, she... It, it, this is what so so a couple of things like like people uh, sort of uh, they don't they're not aware like of how many hours it actually takes to homeschool and, and sometimes depending on the age it's like thirty minutes sometimes it's like only two hours even in high school you know um, so the, these you know these this girl like she would do her two hours of homework you know or, or, or work sorry um, <laughs> and be and be done by eleven. And then she'd be like, yeah, well, I had already done all the work and then I would go and I'd do things that I enjoyed. And she, she's this amazing painter. So as a young kid, she would like go and she'd sort of get out her, her paintbrushes and her Essel and canvas and she'd be painting, you know, for like three, four hours, whatever, waiting for her mates or friends to finish school because they were in public school and they would all walk past her house after school. And then they would come and they would, everyone would be playing at her house. Um, uh-huh. So her... I mean, just in terms of like the actual amount of work, it's, I think it's not anywhere near what people think, you know, because like you said, there's so much sort of extra fluff in a school day that is not necessary uh, and is, and is probably a waste of time. Um, so, so yeah, it's just, um, it's incredible. Like uh, what the, what the kids can actually sort of get through and, and all the extra stuff they can learn just yeah. because they've got the time. They get to develop who they are so much more because they have free time instead of sleep, school, homework, sports, bed, you know, and then do it all over again the next day. Um, yeah, all of, well, I grew up that way. You know, I had lots of free afternoons. My sister did. And so we pursued hobbies and had fun. You know, we did, we did stuff with our parents at home. We had a good relationship with our parents, but we also got to really learn to do things that we loved and pursue that. And um, I mean, for both of us, it really influenced who we are today. My sister would, she had a little camera and she would take pictures of our pets and her dolls. And, you know, she just kept practicing photography. Well, she still does photography now. And I was, um, I was a writer <laughs> when I was a teenager and I wasn't thinking I'm going to be a writer someday. I just loved to write. And so I filled notebooks full of things and, and I was, you know, a heavy reader and I loved history. So I just would read more and more history. And so, uh, because I had all that time, it, it my own interests kind of f- filled me with the desires that I still have today and, and the passions that I still have today. And my kids are the same way now, um, they all have had that free time to really just explore who they wanted to be and what they wanted to do. And they got good at different things. And so um, it's just that so many kids don't have that free time. And, and then of course, today with all of the technology that kids have, I think their, their lives are just being sucked away from them. And, and it's really sad. So um, yeah, when, when people can realize that all that busyness is not really doing anything 
it's it's such a freeing concept. I, I really like that what you touched on there about the phones um, and, and the distractions there because this is a, this is something I would just like to t- chat about and is, is, is something you've written a lot about too and, and is probably the parents' main concern when it comes to homeschooling is uh, so, so socialization, right? Uh, so you, you, write, you wrote, um, the wisdom of the world says that for kids to know how to interact with other people, they must be around other people their age all day, every day. Ha, huh. that's about the worst parenting advice I can think of. Stop <laughs> falling for uh, the what's about so- socialization fear. So yeah, let's, let's maybe discuss that for a little bit because people are like, oh, you're homeschooling your kids. Like how are they going to interact with other, other kids? Like how are they going to make friends? Like these sort of things like, I read your whole blog article on it, and it was, it was fascinating. Um, and how, how do you, how do your kids socialize? Well, believe it or not, they leave the house. You know, they're not locked up in the house for months at a time. It's weird because I think that's what people really believe that they never get to leave and go anywhere, and it's laughable because often we're so busy that I'm exhausted from going here and there, and you know, all the activities. Um. So just to be clear, homeschool kids do leave their house. They do talk to people. They have friends. Um, Where I live, it's a pretty small rural area. Um, I think our county has, you know, maybe 25,000 population. I don't remember. It's not big. Anyway, but we have a really large homeschool community here because it's I mean, I grew up in this area, so it's been around since I was a kid and the homeschooling just has grown. Um, And so our homeschoolers get together and do things and we go to church. Um, As soon as the kids are old enough to get a part-time job, they do. So they go work in the public eye, you know, they work with strangers and, but um, not being at school doesn't keep them from knowing how to talk to other humans. You know, that's, it's just a normal thing. Humans are social people. And so apart from the very, very shy kid, everyone talks to people, you know, they, they see the trash truck driver and they wave when they're little and they say hi to the, the Amazon delivery person or the mailman or the grocery store cashier. I mean, it's just normal for humans to communicate. If you look at little kids who've never been to school, like, you know, like my grandson is three He talks, he talks to people. He's never been to school to be trained to talk to people. He just knows that's what you do. So if people just, it's like they don't think anymore. They just follow some scripted um, rehearsal of certain questions that you have to ask homeschoolers. And so my kids socialize by going to church, um, going to, we have homeschool cooperatives where Uh, A lot of families get together and certain parents will teach classes on all kinds of things. And so they get to interact with other kids, but also do cool stuff. They, my kids have done dance and theater and sports and, oh my goodness, everything all the other kids do. We just don't go do it at the public school. That's really the only difference. We just do it in a different building or a different park or whatever. Um, And then of course they they spend their day with parents, which means adults. And so they have that ability to talk more to adults and talk more like adults and interact with adults. Um, Homeschooled kids may get to see more of their grandparents, you know, depending on the situation, the neighbors, like I said, any, anyone that comes over or wherever you go, And so instead of just being in this bubble of kids, they are interacting with whoever they come across on any given day. And so I think that, you know, like you said, when you run into homeschoolers, you often feel like you're not talking to a kid because they don't spend all their life with kids. And so they don't just act like kids. They, they're a little bit more well-rounded as far as their ability to communicate. And I mean, just be in a room with other people, they're able to, in most cases, you know, look you in the eye and have a complete conversation and use full sentences and, you know, listen and respond and things like that. And so it's not necessarily just about, you know, signing them up for a sport and then a dance class and then whatever else. It's just living normal life. And, if you ask me, putting them in the school setting 
for their entire childhood is not normal. What we're doing is normal. It's just normal life and interacting with whoever we come across on any given day. And I think if you like, say, if I play like devil's advocate a little bit here, like I, I'm thinking back to to when I was at school, right? And I mean, I I loved I love school, right? So it was, but but it was also very different back then. I think, um, and and I used to spend a lot of time with my friends and and and, and love that part of of socializing. Um, but I do think that school has actually changed a lot over the years. And I think that technology has been a, I mean, I think it's been a net positive, but for kids having phones is definitely a net negative. And um, the problem is, is actually the socializing part is not actually done in a normal way anymore. You know, uh, kids communicate to each other using their phones and that is not a healthy way. You know, I have this discussion with a friend of mine who's actually has his own school um, oh. but he's like, oh yeah, no, kids are different these days. They, they talk on their phone. And I'm like, yeah, but th- that's not normal. You know, that's not actually what? helping anybody whatsoever. Like, uh, the fact that they do it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Um, we still need to learn to talk to each other. We still need to have that, that connection, that bond as a human, like our, our DNA hasn't changed. Um, you know, the way we're doing things has changed, but, um, it, it's not a healthy way to do things. So I think at school, the socializing is is not even socializing these days how how we would sort of maybe even want our kids to experience it. Well, yeah. I mean, even if you say, okay, I understand cell phones are not healthy for my kids. If you send them to school, they're surrounded by kids who do have unlimited use of cell phones. And, and by that, I mean the internet. I mean, unlimited access to the internet. And even if your kids don't have it, they're going to be influenced by it because of all the other kids. And so that's, to me, that's something that I don't think enough people are thinking about. You know, when you say, oh, my kids get socialization, but they don't have the internet. Oh, yes, they do. They they don't have to have their own little device to be influenced by it. And in a in a horrendous way sometimes. Um, and, and the nice thing about in the homeschooling community, I mean, all of the homeschool kids, I know I'd say about 80, 90% of them have cell phones too. Um, But you can talk to parents and say, so what are you doing about limits or what kind of protection do you have on your kids? Or do they have access to YouTube whenever they want? You can talk to the parents and find out, okay, what kids are being more protected and which kids have unlimited access. Okay. So I'm going to find some like-minded parents and we're going to let our kids hang out together because at least I understand that these parents think the same way I do about internet access. You know, that's a huge deal. And then if you, you know, maybe they want to join an activity where there are lots of kids with phones, you know, you go there and hang out too, because that's what homeschool families do. Instead of sending them on a bus somewhere with one or two adults that you may or may not know, or into a classroom all day long at lunch and in the gym and all those things, you have no access and you have no control over what's being talked about and what what music they're listening to, what videos all those other kids have seen. Um, it's almost like when people say, what about socialization? I want to go, yeah, what about that anyway? Because what you guys are doing is not healthy. And so we are, you know, kind of going out there and, and being very careful and selective about friendships and about social events. You know, I'm trying to protect my kids from so much socialization and be proactive and be very specific about where they're spending their time. And so, of course, my kids have friends. Um, You know, kids come to our house. We go hang out and do a lot of activities, but we get to be selective about where they're spending their time and who it's with and, and what they're being exposed to. So... There's a lot of different ways to look at the socialization issue now. For sure. I always think like an an important like a important way to sort of flip things on people is to just ask them the question back. You know, like you said, so so what about socialization? Tell me about your kid, you know, like and then and then they can answer you and you dig a little deeper and you go, "Okay, so tell me about this." And and almost get them to you know, get their wires working and um and connecting and and having a think about what they're actually asking and saying. Uh, one of the things that you've also written a lot about is is sort of bullying and and one of the um, the calls that you get the most from other parents is like you know like how do I homeschool because my kid is getting bullied or there's 
something else going on at school. And I think, you know, we, we also underestimate that quite a lot too, you know, and, 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 and what I've heard in schools in America is even like things like drugs are becoming like a, a problem, which is, I mean, crazy. I, I, I couldn't believe it when some of my friends told me that in America. Yeah. And apparently we've been fighting this drug campaign for such a long time. It's not working. I, I have gotten a lot of calls from parents or grandparents over the years who their child is lead um, to the being suicidal and they just, I've got to get them out and I, I absolutely get them out. That, that is my first piece of advice to any parent whose child is physician because the, they don't need to be under that kind of influence, they need to be treated in a terrible way that they think that they should take their own life. If that is even an issue, get them out of the situation. Don't even worry about school right now. Worry about their life. That's what I just think. These parents who say, well, I've been talking to the principal and I've talked to the teacher and I just go, just take them home. You know, this is not that hard. Take them home. Quit your job. Whatever you have to do. Why is this so hard? Um, but for those parents, I always say just, just stop the public school school. Stop it in the middle of the year, whatever you have to do, bring your child home and let them heal and don't start school right away. You know, you don't have to get a curriculum in place for the very next Monday. Your child has been through trauma and they need to heal. They need, they need to sleep and they need to stay home with you and they need to be counseled, you know, if there's some professional help and they need to be able to just kind of reset and start all over again. And so I, I, you know, in the homeschooling community, we call it de-schooling, which is basically just kind of letting go of all of that. You know, if it takes two weeks or two months, just letting your child just kind of de-stress and start all over again. And you say, okay, you're not in that atmosphere anymore. You're not in that school. We're going to find a different method of education. And, you know, because of the explosion in homeschooling, there's so many ways to get an education at home. and a lot of times that means finding a whole new group of friends and, and getting together for a homeschool support uh, class or field trip or just, you know, the days when they hang out at the park together and, and making new friends is very important. But um, not rushing into school all over again is very important, too. And so that's my number one piece of advice is just get them out. Just don't look back. And. Don't don't think that I've got to be a school teacher now and I've got to restructure our whole day. Everything we've been talking about should help people understand that you just you're just being a parent and part of your day now does include some lessons. But it's a whole day, it's not your whole life, but it's so important for kids who've been through difficult situations like that. Um a whole new life is possible and it's necessary. Never underestimate like, you know, the, the comfort and security that you provide as a parent for your kid and uh, just, you know, them being in your presence, you know. I even say, hey, if, if they just want to watch movies for a week at home, you know, and eat cookies, do it, you know, let them heal and just have that home life. And like you said, the comfort again, let them. Let them just relax. One of the, one of the sort of, like, just sort of like finishing off here, like one of the, the things that I think is probably also like a, a concern of people is, um, you know, what if things go sort of wrong and you, you're teaching your kid, I don't know, like maths or in this particular thing I'd like to talk about is like say reading and, um, you know, your, your kids maybe not up to speed or, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it is, it's, it's a sort of fair concern, um, uh, I had this really cool guy on the podcast. His name was Alvin Irby. He's a he's like a comedian guy, but he also runs this. Um, I guess I guess it's a nonprofit called uh, Barbershop Books, right? Where he puts um, books in the barbershops, like, and this was in I think it was in New York State um, or Massachusetts, and uh, you know, like, often the, the the books are cartoons, and and he always says like, it doesn't matter what your kids are reading as long as they're reading you know and it really made me think yeah that's true you know you actually just want to sort of get them to enjoy the sort of process or whatever you want to call it of of reading like um 
and that and that's very similar to to something that that you've written about you you know a whole article on how your kids have learned differently um and 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 one of the things was i think was really just finding something that interests them uh, you you wrote one day as i was sorting and packing orders <clears throat> claudia picked up a chapter book um on king arthur uh sat down and read the entire book <clears throat> The trick was to find a book she was really interested in. Voila, after that, she took off. And before that, like you'd written, like she wasn't really enjoying it and these sort of things. And th th there's a very like important lesson in there, isn't there? Yes. Um, in fact, I found that to be true with each of my five children at a different rate, a different age. Um, it had to be something that they loved. And so even with my youngest daughter, who she's now 13, um, but she said at about eight years old, eight or nine, she was still struggling. Um, she said, mom, I just feel like I'm never really going to figure this out. And, and she was about to cry and I nearly cried cause I thought, no, don't say that. But it just seemed so hard. And it seemed like a lot of work that was not fun, you know? And I said, no, it just takes time. You just got to keep practicing. And even for a while with her, we probably stopped all reading lessons for about six months because it was frustrating her. And, and I didn't want that. So I thought, okay, let's take a break. We picked it back up later and it, and it went a lot faster. But we found this book on, uh, she loves cats. She's been obsessed with cats her whole life. And this was a little book called Pioneer Cat. And it was just, you know, a fictional story about a, a girl in a covered wagon, but she had a cat and she read that book cover to cover. And all of a sudden she said, I can read a book, mom. And, and it was just so fun, but I knew she would, you know, after having four others that learned to read, I knew she would, but she, she just thought that this is not for me, <laughs> you know, like this isn't going to work for me. Let's just forget it. And, and it just took that book. And so even though the society tells us, you know, by a certain age and grade level, every child should be at this reading level and, and, you know, and then move to this reading level, that's not true. It's, it's just arbitrary. And some kids are going to read early. My boys read very early and my girls read very late and it's okay because now they all read, you know, they all read on pretty much the same reading level, the adults and the teenagers, because they just needed it to go at their pace. And the same with all of the other subjects. Mainly, we're talking about language arts and math at this point, but I learned the same thing with math lessons too, that sometimes a kid is going to need to go really slowly through multiplication and, and another one will go through it really fast because they get it and they love it and they're just going to speed through the book. And so um, I'm I'm a big advocate for going at whatever pace a child needs, whether it's super fast or super slow. Um, and in fact, I don't worry about grade levels in our homeschool. And you'll probably find a lot of homeschoolers are similar. Um, it's not as important as just progressing to the next level. And so when people ask my kids what grade they're in, they always look at me like, oh, what grade am I in? <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, so you're probably eighth grade <laughs> based on your age, but we don't do that. You know, it doesn't matter because whatever subject they're in, like right now, this math is whatever your, you know, whatever level you have reached today. And it might not be where your brother was at this very same age or your older sister, but this is where you are right now. And so if it's hard, slow down, find help. There's lots of help out there, whether it's a a local tutor or, you know, maybe dad's good at this subject or a friend or usually even the curriculum companies that you buy homeschool curriculum from are so friendly to pick up the phone and answer a question. If you have a struggle, say, we're in this book on this page. Can you help us figure this out? And so um, there's so many ways to get help, even if you are not good at a subject, that it's okay to slow down, concentrate, make sure your child masters a concept before moving on. And instead of thinking, well, it's it's April, the school year is about to end and we're not even close to the end of the book, just realize the, the more important thing is helping your child learn this concept before they move forward. 
and they will learn it and they will move forward. It just may not be on the calendar that you had in mind. Very important. And, and the fact that you're able to sort of give them that dedicated sort of time uh, is very different to the, how it is in a classroom, you know, where you're in there with, say, 30 other kids and everyone is learning at a different pace. Some are hating it, some are loving it. And um, you're just not able to get that sort of focus on you, you know. You, you're almost like, highlighted that you're struggling they're like well you know let's bring in your parents and say you're struggling like this is no good I mean what a way to destroy a kid's confidence you know what I mean because they're comparing them to all the other kids in the classroom and that's it's not even realistic but it's also not fair no not at all definitely so I just wanted to find out Nikki uh, like what are you most excited about about the future and do you have anything coming up um I know you've written an amazing book um, and you I think you're writing another one at the moment so yeah what are you what are you excited about? Oh, gosh, I have a lot of stuff in my head. <laughs> so I wrote Anyone Can Homeschool based on my experiences um, after becoming a single mom and homeschooling through a lot of difficulties. And we didn't even touch on a lot of them here, but I learned over the years how many different ways you can homeschool through different circumstances in life. And so that book came out of that Um because I know so many other people go through cir similar circumstances, whether it's health struggles or money or being a single parent, um, working parents, all of that. I just wanted to share how possible it is to homeschool no matter what. And so I shared my story, but I also interviewed a lot of other parents in many different situations and let them tell their stories because you'll see that everybody's story is different. And when I'd say, where there's a will, there are a hundred ways because it's true. There's not just one way to homeschool. And so that's why I wrote that book to just help people get a really quick um, course in, hey, do it anyway. You know, you can do this no matter what. And before I started writing that one, the one that I'm working on now was already forming in my head. And it's basically talking about, you may have read my blog posts it doesn't take 12 years to educate it. Um, so I'm working on a book that kind of fleshes completely because that's, I mean, that's what we've been talking about this whole time is understanding why we think we need 12 years of school, you know, for a certain number of months and hours and days. And then why we don't need that. Where did that come from? How did we get here? And what happened before the school system as we know it? And so that's working on right now. And I hope to help people really think outside the box. And it pull anyone can homeschool you into perspective when you go, oh, this is why. Because it doesn't matter what it is or how old your child is or any of those things. You can really condense this 12-year education into, gosh, I would say seven or eight years if you wanted to. Um, so that's the book I'm working on. Um, and I also am a big history buff. And so in 2020, I started a company called Knowledge Keepers Bookstore. And what I do is dig up old American history books and republish them. And the specific books that I look for are the ones that are written by someone at that time. And so it might be a diary or a journal or letters or someone's autobiography um, or someone's just firsthand account of being at a certain place at a certain time. Because as you where there's so many ways people try to teach history now, and a lot of it is modern opinions or modern views on old things that happened. And so many people aren't getting the whole story or they, we try to judge the past through modern eyes and that's kind of not accurate. And so I grew up reading books like this because I was homeschooled history. And so now when I see people, you know, the internet's just crazy with history stuff. And when I see claims or stories retold, I just go, what? That's not even true. And, and it's hard to say it because people go, well, cite your source. And I, and I just want to go, well, I don't know. I read, I read books my whole life. That's my source. And so I just thought what I need is to bring more of these sources into print. And so these are primary American history sources. They're, they're the books written by 
Columbus, you know, I have his journals and pilgrim um, diaries and you know, all kinds of different things like that so that people can read what was written by someone who was actually there because you, it's really hard to argue with that. You may not like what they say or what they did, but you can't really dispute what they saw and said. So anyway, I've got 20 books in print now so far for Keeper's Bookstore. And um, I'm actually working on something that's a little bit different for that. And that is a, a visual history of America's Christian founding, because we have a really solid foundation of um, from going from the pilgrims way up into the 1900s, at least, uh, a reason for why this country was settled and founded and the Constitution was written and different colonies were founded. I mean, just throughout the, the centuries, it was, you know, for, for this express purpose of spreading the gospel or, you know, to schools were founded to teach children to how to read the scriptures, not just to read. And so there are so many primary documents that show this, that what I'm trying to put together now is an illustrated book that shows each primary document that mentions those kind of things. And so like I said, I have a ton of projects in my head and I'm always thinking of something new, but that's what I'm doing right this minute. That's an incredible project and a, re a really important one. I, I remember years ago, I was walking around a library and I was being shown around by a particular person and they said to me, you know that most of the world's information is not online. And I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, well, think about it. Like, I mean, it's quite obvious. You have centuries of books being written. Uh, and they're still stored away <clears throat> in libraries and, and, and all various different places, you know, and most of that stuff hasn't been digitized. And uh, therefore, so like, you know, the answer that you get on Google, like I said, is probably like a, a more modern answer based on, you know, someone's perspective on something or worldview on something. And uh, so, so it's really, yeah, like, so, like almost all the information, which is probably the most important information, is still in books. Uh, and... Um, it's a really important uh, fact for people to realize, you know. And so many of the books that are out there that people just have easy access to are the newer books. And and they don't question, well, how do we know this or that, you know? And so even with my kids, when, when we're doing a history lesson, I will point to an older book and say, this is how we knew it. Like, you know, I'll, I have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and I'll pull it down and say, right here this is where it says this these monks wrote it down when they saw it happen you know and say this this was an ancient book but now i have the print copy you know that i bought on amazon so we can still have it and know it and and that's what i i keep telling them how do we know this this is how we know because these people wrote it down when it happened and so my other passion is encouraging people to have a home library um because the bookstores and the public libraries, they keep weeding out the old stuff because they they want newer books and they only have so much shelf space. But if every home will acquire a few new books every year, we could preserve some history just house by house and in the minds of the people that are reading the books. And so home library, my thing, and I'm always encouraging more and more print books, not just you know, don't just get your Kindle full of ebooks and don't just look online for information, but buy the books and read the books and then pack your kids. Absolutely. I, I really love that. Um, you know, and there's something about looking at a library. I mean, especially if you like us and you love books, you know, you're like, I'm looking at the, your background there and I'm like, mm, what you got on her shelf? You know, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Um, this it's, isn't it's even a, a tiny bit of it. <laughs> of, of course, yeah, yeah, but I just like still, you're like, oh, you're intrigued, you know, especially if, you, if you're if you a bit of a bookworm. So definitely, definitely that resonates a lot with me. And then my, my last question, Nikki, is what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Gosh, I kind of think that goes to our first, first part of the conversation. For me, it means being given, you know, and I, I'm, I may be, my husband says I'm a big picture person, like I'm a dreamer and I think I am, but I always think, what, what am I going to leave behind me when I die? You know, what difference will I have made in the world? And I always, you know, now that I'm in my fifties, I kind of feel panic, like how much more time do I have? I have a lot to do. You know, to me, that's what I think of when I hear that phrase, just like, there's so much potential 
it, now. There's so much potential on this earth with the the lifespan that we've been given. What are we going to do with it? And and am I going to make a difference? You know, will not necessarily will people remember me, but will I have done something that mattered? You know, to people when I'm gone, will will I've left anything behind that mattered? And so. That's what it means to me. Well, Nikki, if I can let you know that your legacy is going to be pretty marvelous. Uh, I've um, just reading your website, like I'm like, this is a treasure chest itself, you know, like in oh, its, its own library within itself. If anyone is interested in homeschooling, like your website is just like, you know, an absolute gold mine to go and uh, look, look, and you've written, you've written tons, right? So that writing streak is still carrying on which is awesome um both online and and physically uh but yeah i just wanted to say like you you're you're a really incredible lady like you you're super brave um super wise and um I, I just love how you have um sort of tackled your life you know and dealt with all the sort of uh trials that that have been thrown your way um, because lots of people would have probably given up to be totally honest with you, like in, in some of the circumstances that, you know, you've mentioned and, and the ones that you haven't mentioned too, and they would have like gone, okay, it's too much, you know, and, um, maybe sent their kids to school or, or whatever the story is, but you literally, your legacy is like having this ripple effect right now with your kids, um, you know, having been homeschooled and the worldviews that they have and stuff. And, and, and now like with what you're doing with, uh, you know, your, your current books and your, and your business and like you, you're a breath of fresh air and, uh, you, the, the sort of wisdom and, um, resistance that we, that we need in this world. Um, so, so thank you so much for, for sharing it and, and please continue to do so. It's been such a cool chat. That's very kind. I appreciate all of that so much. Mm, no worries. Cool. 